Music theorists have been interested in notions of consonance and dissonance for a really long time. Pythagoras wrote about the music of the spheres and is often credited as the one whose teachings led us to the idea of perfect consonances and their relation to simple mathematical ratios. In the 6th century, Boethius characterized consonants as the blending of high sound with a low one, sweetly and uniformly arriving to the ears, and dissonance as the harsh or unhappy percussion of two sounds mixed together. In time since, we've seen discussions of consonance and dissonance as it relates to the fundamental bass, the tone nets, acoustics, and theories of tonality. Without tonal context, though, it becomes more difficult to characterize notions of consonance and dissonance in meaningful terms. Scholars of post-tonal music, such as Alan Fort, John Ron, and George Pearl, pioneered new methods for music analysis that formed the backbone of mid to late 20th century research on atonal music. While their work did not deal with consonance and dissonance in the same way that we saw it in the past, it did develop tools for directly comparing sonorities that relates in terms of focus. Due to the lack of tonal context, the analysis of atonal sonorities aptly focuses on intervals. If you have yet to watch my earlier video on intervals in post-tonal analysis, click the link in the description below. You'll recall that in that video we discussed four approaches to the analysis of intervals, ordered and unordered pitch intervals, and ordered and unordered pitch class intervals. The last of these is also referred to as interval class. It's this approach that we'll focus on today. When I play these two chords, would you describe them as similar? You'd probably say that they're different enough, but they have some similarities. They're both major triads. They're both in root position in a closed voicing. What about these two chords? They're both obviously different chord qualities, but how different are they? Would you say that they're more different from one another than these two chords? What about these two chords? Is this chord more consonant than this chord? These questions are perhaps easier to answer with a more limited selection of chords, like in the tonal system, than if we have essentially every possible combination of notes at our disposal. This is where looking at interval class content comes in handy. An interval class vector is a tally of all the interval classes contained in a particular sonority. It's a snapshot of the overall sound of a sonority. Since it uses interval classes, it ignores register and order. Let's take a look at the interval class vector for the C major triad. To figure out the interval class vector, we're going to simply figure out the interval class created by each combination of two pitches in the sonority. This is much easier to do if we use the pitch class integer clock face. So the first thing we need to do is rewrite our C major triad as pitch class integers. C is 0, E is 4, and G is 7. Next, we're going to look at the interval class for each pair of integers. Remember, the interval class is the shortest distance between two pitch classes on the clock face. So 0 to 4 is interval class 4, 0 to 7 is interval class 5, Finally, 4 to 7 is interval class 3. When writing out the interval class vector, we write out a scoreboard that tallies the number of interval classes in each sonority. There are six spaces in the interval class vector, each representing one of the six interval classes. In our C major triad example, there are zero interval class 1s, zero interval class 2s, one interval class 3, one interval class 4, one interval class 5, and zero interval class sixes. So our interval class vector is 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. We contain the interval vector in square brackets to differentiate it from the other strings of integers that might appear in our analysis. For our second example, let's look at that really dissonant chord I played earlier. We have F, F sharp, and G, which in integers would be five, six, and seven. Next, we're going to figure out the interval class between each pair of notes in the sonority. 5 to 6 is interval class 1, 5 to 7 is interval class 2, lastly 6 to 7 is interval class 1. Altogether then, we have two interval class 1s, one interval class 2, and no other interval classes. So the interval class vector is 2, 1, 
0, 0, 0, 0. For our third example, I'm going to look at the quartal harmony I played, A flat, D flat, and G flat, or 8, 1, 6. Our first pitch class pair, 8 to 1, is interval class 5. Our second pair, 1 to 6, is also interval class 5. Our last pair, 8 to 6, is interval class 2. So our interval class vector would be 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0. Let's try another example. This time we'll look at the E minor triad. The first pair, 4 to 7, gets us interval class 3. The next pair, 7 to 11, gets us interval class 4. And the last pair, 4 to 11, gets us interval class 5. So the interval class vector is 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. Wait a minute. Where did we see that before? That's right. The interval class vector is the same as the one for the C major triad. This makes sense if you think about it. Major and minor triads contain the same intervals. They're just presented in a different order. If we take order out of the picture, that is, if we look at only interval classes, we should get the same results when looking at major and minor triads. While it may seem odd or even wrong to consider a major and minor triad to be similar or even the same by this description, it makes sense in the broader context of sonorities beyond tertian harmonies. In this context, a major and minor triad are much more similar than, say, a major triad and a cluster of semitones, or perhaps even a quartal chord. The interval class vector allows us to have a broad perspective on the overall sound of a sonority, and allows us to compare sonorities when we don't have reference to a tonal context. Obviously, you can find the interval class vector of any sonority that contains any number of notes. In our previous examples, we looked at three-note sonorities. I'd like to look now at larger sonorities to see how the interval class vector can reveal differences in the overall sound. The first sonority I'll show you is the diatonic scale. Since we're getting the hang of the procedure for figuring out the interval class vector, I'll move more quickly through this. So the interval class vector for the diatonic collection is 254361. This is interesting as it shows that there's quite a variety of intervals in the collection. Further, it has a different number of each interval class. This is a property that is almost unique to the diatonic collection, and many people have pointed out that it is this property that sets it apart from other scales and collections. For example, the whole tone scale's interval class vector looks drastically different than the one for the diatonic collection. It's entirely concentrated on major seconds slash minor sevenths, major thirds slash minor sixths, and tritones. Let's look at another example, the octatonic scale. The octatonic scale's interval class vector looks different from both of the previous scales. Here we see a particular focus on minor thirds and tritones, and perhaps more importantly, an almost completely even distribution of interval classes across the entire collection. This is distinct from both the diatonic and whole tone collections. The interval class vector allows us to see, quickly, the interval classes contained in a sonority. Although it doesn't say anything directly about the consonants and dissonance, those can be rather subjective terms anyway, it does allow us to comment on the overall sound of a sonority, and it affords us one way to compare two or more sonorities. In the case of the scalar collections we looked at, the interval class vector does a really good job of succinctly describing the tangible differences between each collection. When analyzing atonal music, this kind of tool can be very valuable. Thank you.